Hi, thank you very much, uh, Heidi. Um, before I introduce our panelists, uh, I'll briefly introduce myself. I'm a general pediatrician and uh, chief of the Division of General Pediatrics here at Stanford. And I'd like to, as a general pediatrician, set the stage um, with a case of a family that I've cared for. It's the case of Aaliyah, a four-year-old girl with medical complexity. She has severe intellectual disability, congenital heart disease, chronic lung disease, and gastrostomy tube feeding. She's an older sister, a six-year-old sister with early reading difficulties that were picked up in kindergarten, and a single mother with limited literacy skills. This is a common uh, family, type of family that we care for in our complex primary care clinic, where many families draw care maps like these. In the center of the map is the child and the family. And only in the lower left-hand corner are the many individuals that the family has to interact with on a daily or weekly basis in that healthcare system. The other domains in red are the school system that we'll be talking about today, the advocacy system in blue, the support system in green. This is the complex system that many of our patients face every day and every week. And I'm confronted with an essential question that drives my work as a general pediatrician and as a public health researcher. Namely, what sort of systems do we need? Education systems, health systems, and both working together in order to support the health of all children like Aaliyah and her sister. I started answering, asking this question just about 20 years ago today in the primary care clinic here at Stanford Children's Hospital. And I began asking some families whether or not they were reading aloud to their children. Um, Fernando Mendoza, I don't know if he's in the room today, was uh, the general pediatric attending at the time along with Tamara Gershon. And they told me about a national program called Reach Out and Read that was developing. Um, and because this was Stanford, Fernando insisted and insisted again that we study this. And we studied the impact of this program on immigrant children or the children of immigrants here in Northern California. And we found remarkable impact of this program of giving books and reading aloud guidance in early um, childhood well care on the amount of reading aloud that was going on between adults and children in the home. And since then, both here and in South Florida, um, where I worked for 11 years, um, as well as in Haiti after the earthquake, um, I've been very engaged in bringing books and reading into the lives of young children. And then shortly after that, because of a lot of the questions that came as I was educating many pediatricians about the literacy skills of the parents, we asked this question to nearly 400 parents of young children nationwide. Your child has an ear infection and your doctor gives you this prescription. How much medicine would you give your child for one dose? And we asked them to interpret this common uh, uh, prescription for common medication. It requires the parent to find that line where it says how much to give and to locate that amount of liquid medication in a dosing syringe. By a show of hands, who, do you, who here thinks about 10% got that question wrong? 20%? 30%? Good, everybody knows it's usually C, or 50%. <laughs> Actually, in this case, it was 50% got this, this question wrong, and we gave them a, you know, an, an error range to do that. Um, it was after this I, that I found Ruth Parker, who you'll meet in a second, as, as my mentor to explore this concept of health literacy. And since then, we've worked with uh, funding from the NIH and FDA and others to start devising new, more um, helpful tools to help parents to dose medications, um, as well as to bring literacy-appropriate care to a number of different domains, including um, a study that we're now on the eighth year of to improve obesity prevention in the first two years of life. Now, we're not going to talk about obesity prevention. That's Tom Robinson and Anisha Patel coming up, so stay up, stay up for that. But we are going to be talking about some of the cutting-edge research uh, in literacy and child health. And I have um, three phenomenal international experts on, on, on the stage with me to take us uh, through this journey. Uh, first, we're going to hear from Bruce McCandless, who's a professor in the School of Education and by courtesy uh, in psychology uh, here at Stanford, who will be talking about 
early brain development and its implications for literacy and numeracy, numeracy trajectories in early childhood. We'll then hear from my mentor, Ruth Parker, uh, who's a professor of medicine, pediatrics, and public health at Emory. We'll be talking about health literacy and its implications um, for patients and health systems. And finally, Catherine Snow, who's an international expert um, on child learning trajectories and particularly literacy, uh, is joining us today from the School of Education at Harvard University. We'll be talking um, to us about education as healthcare for young people. So without further ado, I'm gonna hand this over to Bruce. Um, and Bruce, take it away, thank you. Hi everybody. Welcome to the biological slump after lunch. Everyone take a deep breath, bring some oxygen to the brain. And uh, I wanna have some fun today. I wanna talk about the connection of two really big ideas that I think belong to our cohort, our generational cohort, the, the intellectual kind of zeitgeist of our times. We live in the age, as we heard from Carol Dweck's talk, of this notion of brain plasticity, this notion that our experiences day after day in our learning experiences, are actually shaping and changing our brains. If you remember anything from today, if you wake up tomorrow and you have a, a thought or a memory that was actually implanted today, it's because the neurons in your mind have actually changed their connections to allow this new memory to manifest itself in your mind. I wanna connect this idea with the idea of education, of intentionally curating and scaffolding learning experiences for children in order to help them develop and shape their minds so they come to represent the world in new and powerful ways and they develop new cognitive abilities. And um, the tools that we use to do this are developmental cognitive neuroscience. We've got the ability to take the basic machinery of the human mind and map it into these beautiful images that show us systemic structure, show us individual differences, show us what's happening in this physical structure of our brain during the living mind doing its job. But one thing that's really transformational to digging into this and the question of brain plasticity and the question of education is the fact that we're now in the age of developmental cognitive neuroscience. It is now commonplace for us to do something in laboratories all across the country like this, where we have... Okay, I'm taking my back. So remember, what's the most important thing about getting your brain picture taken? Stay still. That's right, I'm to be still like a statue. To image children as they're going through educational experiences and watching the machinery of the mind change depending on the quality and the type and the structure of their educational experiences, we can make these we can ask these novel connections that we couldn't really ask before. We had uh, these abilities. And one of the foundational changes that I think happens in the human mind, which is a little bit underappreciated, it's kind of like the, the goldfish in the water not really appreciating uh, the water, and that is this notion of uh, literacy. We all share this amazing ability to look at these visual features that have been created that link directly to units of thought in the human mind. And we all have mastered this ability to develop thousands and thousands of perceptual expert reflexes so that we can look at any one of these and inside the blink of an eye know exactly what idea in our culture and in our mind it corresponds to. And we can string these together into immersive experiences that are just as immersive as virtual reality and that we can use to learn more things and expand our knowledge. And the most amazing thing about this invention, which is only about 6,000 years old, is that it's really enabled by a change, a plastic change that happens in the human brain pretty late in childhood. So around age five, we ask children who come to this novel, they're being enculturated into this novel um, invention by culture, which has now become foundational to building human minds, knowledge, structures, and thought, and take systems they already have of representing thousands and thousands of visual objects, and they're quite expert at this, and also take systems that they have that can represent thousands and thousands of linguistic spoken words, and they have great expertise at this. But now, we're asking them very late at life 
to engage in a very large-scale plastic reorganization that creates an integrated circuit between these two brain systems has never really existed before. And we need them to master this to the point where they can look at any one of what might be 50,000 visual word forms on the page and link it to any one of 50,000 corresponding particular words in their vocabulary, all within the blink of an eye, this perceptual expertise that supports fluent reading. Now, we know from education, from neuroscience, from centuries of studying the adaptation to this invention, that there are huge individual differences. For some children take to this very, very rapidly. At age three, they can start fluently reading thousands of words. Other children take to this quite slowly. And we can now start to understand and sort of peel back some understanding about what's happening with these systems and how they are changing. And we can start to appreciate that perhaps subtle differences in this linguistic circuitry or subtle differences in the way visual and spatial representations are formed and attended to and differences in the way children attend to the connection between these may actually help us understand why children struggle so, why many children struggle so profoundly and why other children do it quite easily. And also help us understand how can we improve the educational process, the scaffolding and supports that individual children that might have vulnerabilities in the way they represent language or might have vulnerabilities in access to high quality educational experiences that connect and set up this new integrated circuit, how those uh, operate. So uh, I want to walk you through just a couple of you know, major findings in this area, just to give you a flavor of them. And I, there's lots and lots of stuff to cover, but um, just to give you one sense, and I want one take home, is that brain differences matter. There are individual differences in how these neural circuits are set up for children when they come to the task of reading that have a profound impact on how they change and adapt, how they reorganize their brains for this new skill. So we can take a very elementary aspect of human speech perception, just listen to these sounds, da, 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 ta. A subtle, subtle change at the phonetic level can lead children to notice this response. And about half a second after a change like this, we can use electrophysiology to map out what the brain was doing exactly half a second after I made this tiny little change. And um, a postdoc who worked in my lab, Urs Maurer, carried out these studies in kindergarten children in the German-speaking part of Switzerland before children began to read, before they had really any ability to read any word at all. And he found that there were large differences in how children responded a half a second after one of these linguistic changes. Some children produced this really strong left lateralized brain activity pattern. Other children sort of produced a change response, but it was very different in its distribution. And what he found when he followed these children as they went through kindergarten and through first grade and into second grade and into third grade and into fourth grade is that the organization of their brain response to these elementary speech sounds was predictive of their future skill in reading, this emergent skill that hasn't even happened yet. Um, and the nature of this relationship was the fluency with which they could read words in second grade was profoundly impacted and linked to the individual differences in how their neural circuitry was set up for language. So this gives us the ability, in a sense, to do prediction into the future of what the likely challenge is going to be with all else being equal in education. We've also done a considerable amount of research looking at children in elementary school. How do their brains activate when they do this basic process of just looking at words and reading them out loud in a scanner? And we've been going beyond just looking at how the typical brain changes as you go from a novice to being an expert to start understanding what are the meaningful differences in this learning experience between children that wind up having a profound impact on how the whole process is going, how the education process is going, what we can do about it. And some of the highlights of this research, when we look at a correlation map, we can see 
beautifully in these maps, this reading circuit that I'm talking about, these areas of the visual system that become specialized for recognizing all the words in your language visually, <coughs> these phonological regions which are crucial for processing the sounds of your language and the link between these, are profoundly correlated and linked to individual differences in kids' language abilities, specifically their phonological abilities, their rhyming abilities. And we've known this for a long time in the reading literature, but now we're able to see that it's also impacting their brain circuitry. We were doing this study in New York City, and there is a great distribution of children in terms of the access and resources that they have educationally, the quality of those learning experiences, as well as their entire socioeconomic status. We also found very powerful correlations between brain activity in, this region in, in these two regions in elementary school and just knowing what the child's parents' socioeconomic status indicator values were. And I think very importantly, and this is the, the, one of the themes of the talk that I want to finish in the next three minutes, that when we look at these two together, which is something that hardly ever happens, we have sociologists who look at SES effects on health and SES effects on literacy and cognition. We have cognitive scientists and educators who look at phonological skills and how they play a role in you know, changing brain circuitry and skill in reading. But we actually found an interaction between these two, which was a multiplicative interaction. So that the children who were, had low socioeconomic status indicators and the children who had low phonological ability, were at greater risk for reading failure and had less activity in this brain circuit than just adding these two risk factors together. So the slope of phonological skills to brain activity was much steeper for the low SES group than for the high SES group. And we think that this is very important for the way we scaffold and support education and learning in this way. Everything I talked about up until now has been looking at brain correlates. And correlates are mysterious things. They often tell us about syndromes of things that all run together, like socioeconomic status and uh, challenges in language and many, many things. But we've also been taking an experimental approach in order to ask questions about what is it really about a high quality educational experience, a learning experience, that may actually have a causal impact on brain circuitry. Can we figure out what are the elements of a high quality educational learning experience? And can we map that directly using experimental logic to changes in brain activity? We've been pursuing this across a number of studies in which we, again, look at electrophysiology. Now looking at 180 milliseconds after a child recognizes a symbol or looks at a symbol. And we've been doing sort of stop-motion photography with this electrophysiology in order to see how does their brain signals change when children and adults learn a brand new item in the laboratory. This provides a platform to ask, for us to ask these questions. We can present this learning experience, scaffold it with a tutor in a way that helps children to uh, learn these things. And we notice that when learning is unscaffolded and you just have to learn about 16 or 32 of these novel symbols, this new writing system, versus when it's scaffolded and that a tutor is actually helping you to focus your mind in a directed way to letter sound correspondences that occur within the very same stimuli, we see a profound difference just in the approach that the tutor takes to the changes that occur um, due to learning, the plastic changes that occur in the brain. We're also expanding this to a number of studies in which we're taking educational scaffolds in the form of interactive educational video games and examining how they lead to plastic changes within cortical circuitry, which is critical for reading and can help very young children to develop these representations and shape them. We can compare these to control learning experiences and actually capture what is it about contrastive learning experiences that do or do not drive changes in these circuits. And we can expand these to field trials in uh, public schools in which we put these uh, scaffolding devices in the hands of volunteer tutors and demonstrate that that greatly improves the efficacy of the tutoring experience and leads to changes in brain areas. And we hope that this may be able to help us to tackle and change 
this profound relationship that we see in our educational system right now. This was uh, Sean Reardon's work in which he took uh, several hundreds of millions of uh, test scores, 200 million test scores across uh, all of the public school systems, uh, across third through eighth grade, and mapped out overall performance in math and reading relative to just this single indicator of what were the socioeconomic status indices of the family and found this profound relationship. Our work is suggesting that within this large relationship between socioeconomic status and educational performance are huge individual differences of vulnerabilities that kids might have that we have scaffolding mechanisms to address and address directly. And we'll be hearing today about how literacy is linked profoundly to health challenges uh, overall um, and also to sociological factors uh, in children, such as the how when you factor out everything else, literacy alone predicts the likelihood of a teen in a low socioeconomic status uh, neighborhood bringing a weapon to school. So what we talked about during this session was mostly on this early challenge of word recognition and brain reorganization that takes place. What we'll be hearing about in the rest of the panel is the larger map of all of the skills that are woven together to create the literate mind. So I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Bruce. I'm now gonna uh, hand the, um, the power button over to Ruth Parker, who is a professor of medicine and uh, pediatrics and public health at Emory University uh, and an advisor to many federal agencies, including FDA, CDC, so forth. Go ahead, Ruth. Thank you. So I'm just gonna imagine that when you've been a patient or you've been a parent caregiver or a caregiver for a friend or a family member, that sometime during that, you've stopped and asked yourself, could we confuse patients less? Would it be possible to maybe just confuse a little less? It's incredibly difficult to be a patient these days. It's hard to figure out what in the heck you're supposed to know, what you're supposed to do, what have you got to navigate, what have you got to do today? What do you got to do tomorrow? How are you going to pay for it? How are you going to figure out who you're supposed to see? It's so easy to become overwhelmed, and it's really easy to mess up. Well, Lee introduced you to one of his patients. Meet Dave here. Eight years old, older of a couple of kids, missed school 22 days in the last year, hospitalized a couple times. He's on two to three different meds carries diagnoses chronically of asthma, ADHD, allergies. He's got a couple of prescribers. You figure this out when you look inside of his medical record. He takes two to three meds every day. He changed health insurance last year. He also changed it a couple years before that. It's not too hard to see once you have your encounter, we're in the clinic, we're visiting with him, that he's inconsistently controlled, his parents, nor Dave, really don't have a real clear plan for improvement. In our minds, we're thinking, hmm, maybe not activated, maybe not empowered, inadequate knowledge, skills for figuring out what it is he's supposed to be doing. Dave and his parents seem overwhelmed. Well, it's really in this context that almost 20 years ago, Scott Ratson and I wrote a definition for health literacy the degree to which individuals have the capacity to obtain, process, and understand basic health information and services needed to make appropriate health decisions. That definition went forward and was picked up by Healthy People 2010, Healthy People 2020, used by the NIH, and was then used in the Institute of Medicine report, which created this framework. That report was released in 2004 and really showed in the center that health literacy was impacted by the health system and by your experiences there, your exposures there. Also, culture and society. Where do you come from? Who are you? What are you a part of? The education system. What's been your formal exposure through the education system to help you have skills that might help you navigate what it is you need to know and do 
now that you're inside of the healthcare system. And all of these do have an influence on health literacy, which is related to health outcomes and to cost. As a matter of fact, we now know that how you view, understand, and take actions for health really do matter. It's a multi-billion dollar problem. It's related to inadequate, inaccurate knowledge of multiple diseases and treatments through a series of studies that have been done over the last three decades. We also know there are poor self-care skills that relate to medication use, monitoring, device use, inappropriate health services use, and all of these things translate into some pretty costly issues, like non-adherence, costly urg urgent care visits to the emergency room and hospital admissions, medication errors, adverse events, worse health outcomes. All of these are part of what we've learned through three de decades of research as we've tried to figure out more about health literacy. So what are the big challenges here? Well, the headline, and it continues to be, is that most people cannot understand the health information that they need in order to take care of their health, in order to use health care. It's really just not how we're set up to do business on our side as health care providers. It is incredibly hard to be a patient, and it's really easy to mess up. And this, indeed, is an issue of quality. It's been linked, and it's essential for self-management, for reducing disparities, and for decreasing cost, all of which are national goals for improving health. Well, this is a framework that I created 10 or 12 years ago, and what I was doing here was really trying to highlight on the left side, skills and abilities, and we spent at least a decade measuring those of different populations, looking at what they are, those got published, and indeed they slow you down. They're in the yellow. Your skills and abilities slow you down, but guess what? It's the demands and the complexities of what it is you need to navigate, understand, and do that stop you and are, re and are represented by the red arrow here. Well, in the middle, and when they align, you get health literacy, and we all want to grow the green. Well, what we have in reality now is a misalignment. The demands and the complexities greatly overwhelm what we know to be the reality about the skills and the abilities of people trying to understand what they need to do for health, maintain it, and what they need to do when they access the healthcare system. Let me show you how we use this framework with, a, with an example, a closer look at a pill bottle label. Um, skills and abilities as they relate to the labels on one side, demands and complexities on the other side. Do parents understand how to safely give, give their children medications? Well, it's actually a prescription for confusion, if you will. This is a real example, a mother who's a health educator, father who's an academic general internist, daughter, Six-year-old daughter was diagnosed with H1N1 flu during the swine flu epidemic a few years ago. This was in Atlanta. This happened to be the family of my research coordinator. Um, I had this great idea. We were looking at the H1N1 surge in Atlanta and trying to figure out um, a way to try to help people with triage, self-triage. Do you need to go to the emergency room? We don't, we don't want them to get too crowded. And so I had my research coordinator go into the flu dorm on our Emory campus. I thought, what better than to go interview people who have the flu and see if they can use this triage tool we're trying to make health literate by design. She goes in, she goes home. A couple days later, her, daughter, her daughter's sick, goes into the pediatrician, state-of-the-art practice, and her daughter's got swine flu. And this state-of-the-art practice electronically sends the prescription for Oseltamivir to her local pharmacy. And here it comes, this is the box it's in, and inside is a dosing device. It's a syringe with units measured in mass, milligrams. And on the label, you'll note the SIG line, as we call it, as prescribers, of what she needed to give her daughter. Daughter's crying, her dad's on the faculty with me at Emory. They call me up and say, what in the heck are we supposed to do? We've looked online, we opened up, we even got a magnifying glass and we read the little thing that's inside this box. What are we supposed to be doing here? Well, we did have a problem. 
He's not a pediatrician. Those in the room know how to do this math. But why are we asking people to do this at home? Why are we asking parents to have to do the math? Well, it turns out the oseltamivir was coming out of the national stockpiles during the H1N1 surge in our country, and that dosing device was in all the cartons. So we knew we had a pretty big problem. We did get a response from a couple of the federal agencies about it, saying, yes, we need to do something about this. Well, the truth is, the people who understand what they know are the real experts, and patients are the real experts here. They know what they know. They know what they understand. And they've also told me very wisely, they often also know a whole lot more than they do. But they do know what they understand. And what we've really learned in this field is we have to partner with the experts. And the experts are our patients, because they know more about those complexities and those demands and their own skills and abilities and what it takes to align those. We did that with Healthy Mothers, Healthy Babies, as they went forward with their text messages about that, that were a part of a very large national and then international program. We worked with pregnant moms with low literacy skills to figure out how can we take these text messages to make them more understandable, using active voice instead of passing voice, making specific actions step by step of exactly what you want and need to do, and making sure that if we included a phone number, something really happened when you dialed it. We're not always exactly real in what we do. So we've also created a health literacy principles checklist for using with content to try to make sure that content is as understandable based on the best principles that we know of for making it accessible, understandable, navigable, user-centered, meeting your needs, focused on the need to know to do rather than what we as physicians, I would say, do so well. We're masters of revealers of content and we can do it in long prose. Instead, what people really want to know is, what do I need to know and do to get through this right now so I can move on with my life? A group of us at the Institute of Med or actually, I guess it's now the uh, Health Literacy Roundtable on, uh, out of the National Academies, there was a name change, um, but the National Academy's Roundtable on Health Literacy created a, uh, um, 10 basic fundamental building blocks for a health literate healthcare organization. I'll tell you, these are all aspirational. We were not able to identify any one organization that does all of these, but if you did, you'd be getting a lot closer to being able to take those complexities and demands and really align those with what we know to be the realities of our patients in terms of their skills and abilities. You'll note these here, the leadership's got to get engaged. I'll tell you one I'm very proud of, and that's the one at the very bottom there, explains cost and coverage, so that you really understand what it is that you need to know and do when you make decisions about what you can afford and what you're going to prioritize. But, but we've got ways to go here. When the report from the Institute of Medicine came out in 2004, I think our, our vision was right on target. A society in which people have the skills they need to obtain, interpret, and use health information effectively. And within which a wide variety of health systems and institutions take responsibility for providing clear communication and adequate support to facilitate health-promoting actions. Dave would be a different guy. His family would be in a different position. Were we really able to do that? But I still think it's the right vision, and I think we've got some exciting opportunities here. I've been thinking a lot about democratization of health, like, a many, like many others right now. Some really exciting opportunities there. Everybody participates, huh? It reflects everybody, maybe. Maybe it's affordable. Maybe it really does leverage economic opportunities and make healthcare more affordable and accessible to everybody. I mean, that's, that's great. Well, it needs to be health literate by design. We need to, on the front end, figure out how we're going to make this something that is accessible, 
navigable, useful, meets people with what it is they need to know and do, friendly, has a good attitude, it's helpful. Content processes personalized, convenient, outcomes oriented relevant across the lifespan. Maybe we really start thinking about what age, you know, what age do we really take the patient and really make them someone who grows across the lifespan into someone who feels ready and able to take advantage of what it is we know about health and well-being. So I think we've got some exciting opportunities. I think we're also really fortunate. We, we can look at right where we are today, and we can also look at where we've been, and we can figure out how to do it better. And I really think that by taking health literacy and putting it on the ground, making it a part of what our other efforts pass through, we'll one day really be able to say that healthcare truly is accessible, navigable, understandable, and truly patient-centered. Thanks for your time. Thank you so much, Ruth. And last but not least, we have Catherine Snow, who is the Patricia Graham Professor of Education at Harvard University, and is going to talk to us about the education system. Um, it's a great pleasure for me to be here. Uh, it's not exactly my natural sort of environment. Um, and so I hope that the message I have about the connections between education and healthcare um, come across. Uh, basically, if you want to just go to sleep for the next 10 minutes, that, was, that is the message, that these are closely connected domains and we've, we're uh, wasting a lot of effort by not seeing those connections and seeing them uh, earlier and, and making them stronger than they currently are. Um, now, you might think that education is healthcare is too bold a statement, although I think Ruth has sort of made that, made that point for us um, fairly effectively if you think about literacy as part of access to healthcare. But when I say education here, I'm talking about education broadly speaking, and I'm really focusing on education for children before school age. Um, early childhood centers uh, serving children zero to four and the kinds of educational experiences they offer, parent education programs, home visiting programs. Um, these have proven advantages. Uh, historical studies, you've all heard, I'm sure, about Perry Preschool, you've all heard about the Abbasidarian Project. Um, those were focused on the most disadvantaged children, and unfortunately for a long time, they were the only two we could cite as demonstrating long-term effects. But there have been a lot of studies more recently, um, and a, a just this year, a paper came out uh, reporting on a meta-analysis of 22 high-quality studies, that is to say experimental or um, rigorous uh, regression discontinuity design studies done uh, since 1960 that showed uh, positive effects of, early, of access to early childhood center-based programs for children, reducing special ed identification, reducing grade retention, and increasing by a good chunk there, by 15 or 10 percent or so, the likelihood of high school graduation. So early childhood programs can help, but early childhood programs are quite variable in quality and in design, and um, we have to think a little bit more deeply about how they work and why they often don't work as well as they should. <coughs> how do they work? Well, they have direct effects on kids, obviously. Opportunities for, the, for social interaction with peers and with adults, uh, opportunities for cognitive and language stimulation, opportunities uh, to practice executive function, attention, to uh, develop attitudes toward productive attitudes toward learning. Um, indirect effects on parents, reduction of stress, parents not being with their kids all the time is actually good for them. Um, models to the parents of optimal interaction, of language and literacy focused interaction, um, and explicit guidance very often to parents about talking and playing with their, with their young children. And of course, there are the positive effects on society, uh, releasing women into the workforce um, and promoting adult mental health because uh, women who are economically secure and productive in society 
feel better about themselves. Um, so think of that as the sort of classic early childhood program, and then how do you get there? Well, one primary mechanism for getting there is providing uh, professional development to the adults who serve the children in such programs. So let me tell you about one little study I was involved in. It was in Chile, um, and it was uh, a professional development for teachers of four- and five-year-olds uh, in the public schools. The public schools in Chile serve only the bottom 30% 30 per 30 or so of the economic distribution. So these are very... Uh, under-resourced uh, families. Um, we called the program a buen comienzo, a good start. And um, we provided training uh, to the teachers about language and literacy, about classroom management, and about health. Uh, and uh, a long, complex, randomized cluster trial, lots of assessment, lots of observation, the bottom line was, after two years of intervention, we had zero impacts on kids. We were a little horrified, as you might imagine. Um, we had no impacts on the literacy uh, skills that you see on the top left there. Um, the bottom right, you see the children displaying with great glee their alcohol-gelled hands, part of the health intervention. Um, so maybe they had cleaner hands, but we couldn't test that. Um, and you might say, well, why not? Well, have a look at these classrooms. Uh, the classrooms are very crowded. They're quite small. They have lots of kids and few adults. Um, however well prepared the t adults were to deliver language and literacy skills, it was a hard thing to do in these, in these settings. Um, and uh, fortunately, our collaborator, Mary Catherine Arbor, who was herself an, an MD and was the uh, designing the health intervention in this study, um, had, uh, had observed that the, the rates of absenteeism in these classrooms were very, very high. So she had the idea to go in and figure out whether there was a difference between the kids who were there more often and the kids who were most often um, absent. She developed a risk uh, indicator for absenteeism and ultimately analyzed uh, impacts of the program on children as a function of their risk of absenteeism. And she found uh, that the, the quintile, the top quintile uh, of, uh, of presence um, among those children, there was indeed a significant effect of the program. In other words, the program worked, significant effects on children's letter word ID, on children's spelling scores, but um, those effects are not obvious if the children don't come to take advantage of all the wonderful things the, the teachers in the, in the classrooms are doing. Um, so you might ask, why were kids absent at such a high level? Well, um, uh, in ethnographic studies and in interviews with the parents, we discovered that the parents really never sent their kids to school if they showed any uh, symptoms, of res particularly of respiratory problems. Chile, uh, Santiago in the winter is cold. The schools, you'll notice from this picture, are not heated. <laughs> um, there's very often uh, r sort of torrential rains, which means kids have to walk through knee-deep water to get somewhere. Um, and, and so the parents quite sensibly say, no, 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 school isn't important enough. My kid's going to get sick. Uh, the weather's not good. Um, and they don't really understand these programs as educational programs, so the health concerns trump the um, education concerns. You'll notice, by the way, that Chile's, uh, which uh, 25 years ago had a, a problem of undernutrition, has definitely beaten that one. Um, so uh, that's one example of the complex interactions between health and, and uh, education. Uh, Lee already talked about Reach Out and Read, and I don't need to comment on it further, except to say that I think one of the underutilized aspects of Reach Out and Read as a program is not just that it gives books to parents, which they might or might not know how to use, but that it gives the pediatrician an opportunity to see how children and parents interact around books. And that's a very powerful potential screener for whether there's literacy act there are literacy activities in the home. Um, but a big question is whether parent programs like Reach Out and Read are as good as 
uh, center-based programs, as early childhood centers. And that's an, essentially an impossible question to answer in the US because of selection differences, who goes to center-based programs and who is only available to participate in parent-based parent education programs. But in Bhutan, which is a country you might have heard of that sort of unfortunately clamped in between China and, uh, and India, sort of to the east of Tibet, um, much of Bhutan is rural and there's very poor services for very young children there. But it was a place where it was possible to test this question of whether home-based uh, programs are, can be as good as center-based programs. Um, and the center-based the center -based programs had been evaluated. Uh, Save the Children introduced home-based uh, home programs uh, using medical personnel uh, as uh, delivery mechanisms for new procedures for interacting with kids and reading books and so forth. And they found that, in fact, the home-based programs were just as good as the center-based programs on pretty much every uh, cognitive dimension. Uh, the only place where they were s significantly less good uh, was the motor skills. So it seems like going to a center, running around with other kids, does improve children's motor skills um, more than um, doing something at home with your parents. But other than that, it is very possible to design parent visiting and home-based programs that work well enough to be worth the investment. Um, but again, how do we design high quality programs? Well, let me digress for a moment into the world of pure developmental psychology um, and tell you about a study which I think has received far, few, far less attention than it deserves. Uh, it was published over 10 years ago and it was an intensive study of transcripts of parent-child uh, conversations in four families. Um, and uh, Shui Nair, who did this study, observed that in these families, during these interactions, there were on average 70, there were across the four families, 75 to 150 child questions per hour. I mean, we all remember that, right, with our kids, like, but why, but why, but why, right? The, well, these questions, which might just seem annoying to adults, actually are pretty consequential for children. They care about whether they get the answers, and they repeat the questions if they are not responded to. Uh, whereas they don't repeat other, they don't repeat, uh, other kinds of utterances. 75% of the children's questions are information-seeking, and about 75% of those information-seeking questions get adult responses so, that are informative, that are relevant. So think about this. I mean, do the math. 100 questions per hour, let's say, more or less. Three hours a day of interaction, 365 days a year between the time when children are uh, one and a half to the time that they're five and a half? Anybody done the math yet? Almost 400,000 opportunities to learn in a middle-class household um, before kindergarten. Now, if, if those questions are posed in a place where parents don't answer or tell the kids to shut up, obviously um, the opportunities to learn are squandered. Nonetheless, this displays, I think, how curious children are, how eager they are to learn, how insistent they are on getting information about topics they are interested in. And that's um, what we would like to make sure happens in every early child care setting, either through parent education or through center-based care. And can we ensure that it happens? Well, I think only with a serious upgrade to the system. Um, I would say that the US early child education system is as outdated as the rest of our infrastructure. Some of you may have been on those wonderful trains in China that cross the country uh, at high speed with good Wi-Fi. Um, Chinese early childhood resources in the cities at least are rich and good um, and uh, responsive to children's interests. Um, in the rural areas they are not, but your colleague Scott Rosell is doing what he can about that. Um, in Norway, uh, for example, uh, that's the Flitog, the, the train that gets you from Gardermoen, the airport, to the center of Oslo in 22 minutes. Uh, and um, full, one year of full family leave after a child is born, center-based care available to all children aged one to four, 
lots of opportunities to explore and play and, and uh, satisfy curiosity in those centers. And immigrant children are prioritized for placement in the centers if there is a shortage. Um, the US ECE system is, uh, is outdated. That's the, the green train, the train I take uh, in Boston into, into town if I have to. Um, it, it's 60 years old and falling apart and our early child care system is very like that in many, uh, many parts of, uh, of the country. Um, there is, of course, a, a role here for a larger uh, merging of healthcare and education, and I think only if we start to think systemically, if we think of this as an infrastructure issue, uh, will we be able to provide the supports that uh, are really needed, supporting parents so they have the capacity to create loving and low-stress home environments, showing them how to make those environments cognitively stimulating and fun by answering questions, uh, convincing policymakers that investing in young children is the right thing to do, uh, and showing them that it pays off, ensuring the availability of high-quality early child care settings for, young ch for children zero to three, and expanding the expectation that public schools will serve children as young as three with fully qualified teachers and well-planned curricula. Um, all of those are necessary, and all of those will only work if the children who uh, have access to these, these uh, facilities are, are healthy and able to benefit from them. Thank you. Catherine, th thanks so much, and thank you to Bruce and Ruth as well. I'm going to kick us off with a question, and, and while we are, please, um, uh, any folks from the audience who'd like to chime in, please do. Um, that was a great way of weaving that all together for us, uh, Catherine, sort of the potentials for bridging um, two different systems, the education system and the health system. We're taking on the challenge of child X in that way. Um, I'm curious uh, from the other panelists of other low-hanging fruit uh, that you might see. One, one thread that I picked up in your talks was that perhaps we should be using more educational outcomes in the child health arena and considering educational outcomes the way we do standard health outcomes. And perhaps the other way around, perhaps there are ways of using health outcomes in the education system. So I'm wondering if, if you can respond to that at all. Well, I, w I think using health outcomes in the education system, particularly not so much in the early childhood mm -hmm. period, but in as children get older, and I, I think we'll hear some, some relevant uh, ideas in the next panel, but children, there are massive opportunities in uh, elementary uh, science curriculum and uh, social studies curriculum to promote health and to uh, get kids engaged in uh, both environmental and uh, personal health uh, campaigns that would improve their understanding of these issues as they, as they grow. So yes, I totally endorse that idea. I mean, there are established national health education standards that have been around for years that are good, but um, find people who've met them. So they're, they're good efforts, they're good intentions, but I think some of this also ends up being a decision of what we decide to do based on what we value and what, what, what outcomes we really want to see. Being intentional yeah. about where we put efforts is, is critically important. Great. Thank you. Um, we do have a question here. It looks like it might be for primarily for Bruce, but everybody can chime in. So what impact does the use of electronic devices have on brain activity in child literacy? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's, a, that's a great question. I think it's one that's really increasingly at the forefront of researchers' minds about how is this big change from kind of handwriting and um, kind of pa physical page-based literacy to these electronic devices. And um, there are some people who have argued very powerfully that the patterned light that comes when you fixate on a word is not really all that different when you're looking at a screen or a tablet or a phone or a physical page. But some of the things surrounding that might be quite different. So there are affordances of reading, a tec reading text on a device that seem to encourage kids to, and adults to skim for more information, to get, make a very shallow pass through lots and lots of pages. And there are some affordances about the serial order of a book with written pages that really encourage children to read in a serial fashion more deeply. And that has consequences for the representations they pull away from those pages. Uh, 
children who read something in a serial book are better able to reconstruct the sequential order uh, of things, um, for instance, is one of the, the differences that have come out of, out of this research. So the screens are not completely toxic then. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, I'm wondering out of that, are, are there any particular recommendations? There, there are not a lot of pediatric practitioners here that, mm -hmm. you know, you, any, any way to summarize that message they could, we could take into, you know, the exam room tomorrow? Yeah, all oh, the differences uh, seem to be small, but um, there are lots and lots and lots of benefits of printing something out on paper and re engaging with the page. There's also some really fascinating research suggesting that um, the act of handwriting letters can actually change the brain processes engaged in recognizing <coughs> letters. And so this may be a particularly kind of useful way of building up really crisp, action-oriented, kind of perception for action-driven templates of what letters should look like and what's important about letters. And as kids get farther and farther away from that experience and that expertise, there might be very different representations that are formed that we're just starting to understand. Great, thank you. There's another question from the audience. Are there any companies developing effective services to compensate for lack of health literacy hmm. or best practices to improve health literacy? Ruth, you want to? Companies. Um, I mean, you're, I would say not specifically, not on a broad scale. There are certainly some best practices. There are health systems. There are communities. There are various populations that are taking on and saying, how do we make what it is we do something that is more health literate? And those building blocks that I showed you out of the round table are really the criteria. There has been a pretty good look at how those have been put into practice with some case studies. There's a growing body of, of information about interventions. I will also just say, because I think it's very interesting to sort of think about how we, how we listen when we look for um, what works when you've got such a big challenge. So really becoming health literate and making ourselves, and I put myself as part of that, any of us connected to the provision of services for health or health care are really the target audi audience for becoming health literate. We're a lot more likely to talk about the challenges because the problem is so big than we are to really dilate the solutions. There are some successes, but it's really taking sort of an intentionality of this did work, we've got to do more of this. This does work, we've got to dilate it. And I think a lot of that will come on community levels and, and within various populations. So I think as we move forward, and I certainly think big data and analytics offer an enormous opportunity mm -hmm. for getting inside of that. And I would say, you know, a dream for me is, boy, AI has left the station trains out of the station, how do we make it health literate? How do we do that on the front end? And what are the opportunities that could really be available to so many if we take that on as part of the challenge? That's, that's a great challenge, thanks Ruth. There's another question, um, Catherine, I think we'll let you take this one first. What do countries like Finland do to integrate health education into education? I am going to turn that back and ask if anybody in the audience who knows. I have no idea, actually. Yeah. I know that uh, every single child in Finland, when they're entering elementary school, uh, is given really high-quality scientific-based opportunities to explore the very elements of literacy. And if they're showing any signs of struggling with that adaptation during the first months mm. of passing through, they automatically go right into getting lots of really well-supported practice on the particular things that they're having challenges for. Uh, Finland is the home of the largest study that's ever taken place in human history of the acquisition of literacy. They study children before, several months before they're born to parents that have a history of dyslexia or parents that have no history of dyslexia, and they follow them all the way up into third and fourth grade. Um, this is something special about Finland. If you're born in Finland, the most likely place you're going to die is Finland. People um, participate in these studies. They've got tremendous retention rates, and they've learned a lot about the, all, the entire developmental cascade uh, of literacy and how to support it and what early warning signs are. It's also an incredibly egalitarian country, so when uh, Finnish citizens uh, have a child, there's tremendous services and supports available to them, uh, both early on during the first months, parental leave, um, and... Um, kind of supports throughout 
our early childhood could be a model system for, uh, for our country. I would just add, Bruce, that that would be a dream in healthcare. Mm -hmm. What if, as you were diagnosed with your acute or chronic illness, someone really took time to note what it is you need support? What if we adapted and adopted what we do to really meet what we can identify as the real needs of people, as they're working to live with and accommodate to whatever it is? That's a dream, but the same kind of principle applies. It means that you've got it on your agenda, you're going to work that way, you're going to model yourself that way, you're going to know what it is, but you're also going to tailor how you deliver and support people based on what it is they really need in order to be able to be successful. I don't, yeah, piling on a little bit with how, uh, how envious we all should be of the North, North, <laughs> yeah. Nordic countries. Um, in, in Denmark, for example, uh, kids at 11 months have a vocabulary screening. <laughs> a parent report instrument is used. And so if kids at that age have not yet produced the first word or shown any comprehension of words, they are automatically flagged for potential early intervention. But I, but I think the, the important thing to say about the Scandinavian and Nordic countries in general is that they are not thinking about this as a return on investment issue. They're thinking about this as a moral issue. They feel like everybody's, everybody's kids are our kids, and that's why there is no uh, there, there are no holds barred in, in, in these kinds of, of programs and making them available. And the model in the U.S. Is, is really not that we care as much about other people's kids as we do about our own. That makes it hard to deliver uh, services at that same level of quality and ubiquity. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Well, um, on that note of the moral imperative, uh, which is a great one to, to end on, I want uh, the audience to join me in thanking Catherine Snow, Ruth Parker, and Bruce McCandless for taking us on this journey. And I believe uh, we're up for a break, is that correct, Heidi? So a brief 15-minute break. Enjoy.